right. Welcome, everybody. Video ready? OK, great. Welcome, and uh, welcome to today's lecture on classification and PCA. So first, a couple housekeeping items. Um, homework two is due on Thursday. I'm sure you're all aware of this. And I hope many of you started already. I know some of you already finished. So hopefully that will put some pressure on the rest of you to really get going. Um, homework two is, again, a lot of work. So please start early. Homework one grades will be out Monday night. Um, you know, maybe a little bit sooner, but definitely by Monday night. So you should know how you've done on homework one. We actually tried to get it to you before the drop deadline on Monday. So hopefully that will happen. And then homework one solutions will be available on Tuesday. OK, so today we're going to talk about classification. Um, how many of you have any experience with classification? And, OK. So uh, what kinds of classification examples do you have? Where did you use classification? Give me some examples. Yeah. Sorry? The remainder in the division of n. I have no idea how that is related to what we're going to talk about today. Do you know? Is that a different kind of, is that a mathematical classification? Yeah, but never. So we're talking about something completely different today. <laughs> <laughs> Any other examples? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so classification of email. And what is the biggest kind of classifier for email that's in use today? And you said it's using Bayesian, but what does it actually classify email as? Spam, right? So the spam classification of email, that's a really good example. So email is either spam or not spam. And you know those labels are the, class, the classes for email. And the classification is the task of giving a new email is it spam or not? Any other examples? Yeah. Uh, so translating a piece of spoken language into text. Now that is a particular machine learning task, and it is related to classification. Um, but I think, yeah, I guess it's. Would you call that classification, Verena? Uh -huh. Kind of. Yeah. Of what language it is, yes, that is definitely classification. So given some text, figuring out which language it is. Again, you're giving a label to the text. It's Spanish or English or Chinese, yes. Any other? Maybe from the back? I saw some hands in the back. Yes, all the way in the back. Uh, employers try and classify job applicants as worth hiring and not hiring. <laughs> yes, so uh, employers trying to classify job applicants into worth hiring or not worth hiring. Um, <laughs> I hope that's not happening by machines. <laughs> but it's a good example of classification, exactly. Now, what do all these examples have in common? Well, we start with data, right? We start with data. And then what do we do with the data? What do we assign to it? Labels, exactly. So we take data, and we assign labels to the data. OK, so one of my favorite examples, and that's because I'm a, a visual person, is actually the task of image classification. So given an image, can, you, can the computer tell what's in the image, right? So can the computer assign labels to the image that tells me this image is a cat, a dog, or a car? So to give you a little bit of motivation, I want to show you a really cool demo put together by MIT, which is called the MIT scene recognition demo. And what they put together is a classifier that takes an arbitrary image of a scene. So that's usually you know, a larger scale image. It's not just a, a picture of a small object. It's a picture of a larger scene. And classifies it based on some label database they have. So here are a couple of their examples. So if I give this, this image here, the classifier will say, this is an outdoor environment. Um, the semantic category is rock arch with 75% probability and an arch with 24% probability. So that's actually pretty good, right? 
Um, it's natural light, it's open area, it's a rocket scene, etc., etc. So you can see it does a very good job at this. We can pick another one, so maybe this one here. Here their classifier says this is an outdoor scene and it's a forest path with 71%, it's a forest road with 13%, or it's the rainforest with 5%. I don't know about rainforest, but forest path or road, that's pretty good. Now, of course, these are their images, so you could say, well, you know, <laughs> they put their best examples online, and of course it's going to work. Now, this is a live demo, right? So what we can do is I can take a picture of this classroom and see how it does. Now, I'm going to take a picture of the right-hand side here, so anybody who doesn't want to be in this picture, please move away temporarily. <laughs> if you don't mind, uh, I'll take the picture. Anybody wants to move? Raise your hand. Okay. I promise nothing bad will happen, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so took the picture, so let me upload this. Okay, I can share with anybody here except myself. All right, let me email this to me. <coughs> Sorry, that's going to take a little bit longer than I had hoped. All right, come on. While well, you're all busy reading my private email. Huh. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to save this. Yeah. That's a good place. And I'm going to upload this. And you can do this, by the way, by yourself. Just go to that URL. Here was my office. I tried this. So let's try this with this scene here. So that's the picture I took. And it says auditorium with 98% probability. It's magic. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is an example of classification. and. I'd say classification has gotten scary good for images and even now for scenes. Um, and the reason why it's gotten good is because of machine learning. So we'll talk a little bit about what machine learning is, but then we'll talk about a particular machine learning algorithm called K-nearest neighbor classifier. And I'll explain how that works. And then in future lectures, like next week, uh, Verena will talk about SVM. And then we'll continue with this theme of talking about some machine learning algorithms that will help you with classification. OK, so here is the task for the computer. Given a picture right, of a cat, let's say, you represent this picture, of course, as an array of numbers. Given that array of numbers, classify that with some probability into different class labels. Is it a cat, a dog, a hat, or a mug? Right? Um, now, for us, this seems trivial, but for a computer, this seems incredibly hard. Why is this a hard problem for a computer? Or even for us. It's just we're really good at it. <laughs> Why is this hard? Yeah. So you can't hard code it because there is a lot of combinations. Can you expand? Can somebody expand on this issue of what are all the combinations of pictures in the world that are cats? I mean, what is, what is happening? Why is it hard? Yeah. Even if you're using the same cat, you are 
Yes, angles. Angles of view, right? If I look at something from the side, it looks very different than if I look at it from the front. Yeah. Yeah, it's a three-dimensional object, and we're getting a two-dimensional projection of it. So even if I translate it a little bit, the pixel numbers are completely different, right? It could be the same picture translated 50 pixels to the left. That array of numbers l looks completely different. So it has to be invariant to translation, rotation, and to viewpoint changes. Yeah. It could be occluded, right. Most of the time, things are occluded. You guys are half occluded by the benches in front of you. Right, so anything else? Another very important source of change, yeah? Exactly, different you know, types of the same object. There is, you know, every cat is different, right, in some way. Yeah? Yes, the lighting. The lighting can be different. It could be a shadow, it could be a, a very bright sunlight, it could be indoor lighting, so the lighting makes a big difference. So there's a lot of things, scale variations, right? These are two humans, but they're very different in size. Um, the illuminations, the viewpoints, deformations, that's a cat <laughs> up there. Um, and cats do that, right? And, and we recognize it as a cat. For a computer, it'd be very difficult. So if you had to hard code all of these variations, which, by the way, was the state of the art in computer vision for many years, it's almost impossible. It's very, very difficult, right? Um, I started to do some research in computer vision in the 90s, and we tried to do face recognition. We tried to build 3D models of faces just to deal with the lighting and viewpoint variations. And we were not very successful because there is so many other variations. So what led to the great breakthrough of image classification? Instead of hard coding all of these things, what did they do? Yeah. Yes, lots of data, but what kinds of data? Training data, and what did they do with the training data? Exactly. They had people characterize the training data. In other words, they assigned class labels to all of these training images, and then they used machine learning to basically learn from example. So that's exactly it. You, you basically have to get massive amounts of training data for each of your different classes or for each of your different labels. And you have to then use machine learning to learn by example. It's sort of a data-driven way of explaining the world. Now, this works best if you have thousands or hundreds of thousands or even billions of images. Google made a huge splash in computer vision about 10 years ago when they gave a talk talking about the, um, what was it called? the unexpected successfulness of classification if you have a billion images, right? And at the time, Google was the only company that had a billion images. So anything that you have that has a billion of anything is a lot of data. And if you have people labeling it, even if it's a subset of that, it really makes your job easier. So machine learning is fundamentally given a set of these training sets, right? And so these different classes with n data points. Each has a label from k different classes. And then we learn, the machine learns, what every one of these classes looks like by example. And then the evaluation is you predict the labels for a test set. So that's another set of images that are not labeled. And you compare the true labels. So you have some kind of ground truth. So actually in the test set, yes, you do have labels, but you don't use them during evaluation. So you compare that to the ground truth and then you see how well did your classifier do. That's the game of machine learning, and that's the game we're going to play in the next few lectures. There's two major categories of machine learning. The one I just described is called supervised machine learning. So you're given a training set with labels, and you're trying to predict, given a new data point, what is the label of that data point. And so there's many different algorithms. Today we talk about k-nearest neighbors. Then we'll talk about SVMs, decision trees, random forests, bagging, boosting, etc. The list is, is really, really long. So the important thing there is the data has these categories. In contrast, unsupervised machine learning, such as PCA, which we'll also talk about today, and MDS, or clustering, just tries to find patterns in the data 
without having the labels. Now, <coughs> why isn't everybody just using supervised learning? Why do we actually have these two categories? Yeah. That's right. You don't always have the training data. You don't even sometimes know what the categories are. So if you have data that you can't label because it's so big or you don't know what's in it, you need to detect patterns and you need to look at the data in some way first in order to find its structure. And that's where unsupervised methods really come into play. Okay, so here is the canonic picture of classification in machine learning. So you have essentially data points, here the points in 2D, that have different labels. So here the labels are either red or blue. And they are projected here in this two-dimensional space. Now, the data can actually live in very high dimensional space, right? So what I'm showing you here is just a two-dimensional example, but imagine that you have the data living in this high dimensional space, and the space is spanned by what we call features. And I'll talk a little more about features later. So given this picture, you're trying to find this green line, which is also known as the decision boundary, between those two classes. And the data points are typically called X, and the labels are typically called Y. So that's that notation you'll find quite often um, also in scikit-learn and other pieces of software. And now given a new data point, this black point, you're trying to predict the class or the label that this point belongs to. And in this case, it's very simple. This point is very likely blue with a very high likelihood. Okay, so that's the basic picture. Now the problem is you need to select your features very, very carefully. So for example, if you try to distinguish between apples and oranges, and you look at the features of roundness and weight, those two classes might actually be very, very similar, right? They're in similar size and they're in similar weight. And so there is basically almost no distinction if you pick those two features to try to predict, you know, is it a, an apple or an orange? So the picture looks like this. Those two classes kind of overlap. And it's basically impossible to draw a decision boundary. Whereas if you had picked the labels, or sorry, the features color and shape, those two classes would actually be nicely separated because apples have typically are not orange, right? So you can easily find these two differences uh, quite easily. And then it's easy to draw that decision boundary. So feature selection is a major task in machine learning. And it's more of an art than a science, but we'll tell you a way where you can do feature selection in a more principled way, and that's called cross-validation. So selecting your features um, is actually one of the things that you need to do very carefully. All right, so um, we're going to talk about uh, the nearest neighbor classifier. And I actually want to switch here to non-mirrored. Hope that works. All right, OK. So um, nearest neighbor classifiers basically are the simplest way to classify anything. And it's basically a lookup. So given some labeled data points, in this case the blue squares and the red triangles, you're given a new data point, in this case the green circle, and you're asking what label should it have. And the way nearest neighbor classification works is you look at your nearest neighbors, right? So the nearest neighbors in this dark circle here are two triangles and one blue square. So very likely the green dot should actually be a red triangle. So it's kind of majority voting, right? So you do this by majority voting of your nearest neighbors. Now, if you looked instead at the dotted circle, all of a sudden, you make a different decision. Now, in the dotted circle, you have three blues and two reds. So in that case, you would probably call that green circle a blue rectangle or a blue square. So the size of your neighborhood matters. Yes? So how do you decide the radius of the circle? Yes, so that's a good question. So how do you decide how big the neighborhood should be? 
And the answer is going to be, we're going to have to evaluate the performance of the classifier, and I'll talk about that. So depending how the classifier does, we'll pick how big our neighborhood has to be. Yes? Yeah, so exactly. So how do you do this majority voting? Uh, let's just assume we just do it by majority. In other words, we just say, you know, it's just based on the number of points within my distance, within my neighborhood, and I'll pick the majority. So typically, um, we, we basically assign the number k to the number of data points that we look at. k could be 1, in which case we're looking only at one neighbor, or k could be 3, 5, and so on. So typically, k is an odd number so that we always have a winner, right? But there could be other ways of doing it, but that's the simplest way to do it. Okay, so here's an example. You have two labeled data sets, red and blue, and what I drew here in the background is called the Voronoi diagram. How many of you have heard of Voronoi diagrams? Okay, a few. So a Voronoi diagram basically tells you for each cell which are the closest points on the plane, right? So you know, for one cell around the point, all of those, I should have a pointer. Do we have a laser pointer? Uh, no, okay. Let's see. Well, let me try this. Can you see this? Okay. So let's say for this point here, within this cell here, all of these points are closest to this particular point than any other point in the plane. Does that make sense? And let's not worry about how we draw these diagrams. That's actually part of computational uh, geometry. But, you know, just um, trust me, this is an accurate depiction of which points are closest to which. All right, so I'd like to draw a decision boundary between those two classes based on this nearest neighbor classification. All right, so can somebody be brave enough to use this laser pointer and try to draw the decision boundary on this picture, even with shaking hands? You want to give it a try? So you have to push this button. This one here, yeah. Yes? All right, <laughs> so we have another one. Okay, good. That was very good. Did you guys see this? So let me show you this is it, right? That's the decision boundary. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, so in this case, it, it kind of you know, doesn't look very sh smooth like the one I showed you in my idealized picture, right? So it's a little bit more rough. And that's typical if you do this kind of nearest neighbor classification. Um, in this case, this is a one nearest neighbor decision boundaries, right? So it just says, this is the decision boundaries if you were to pick just one nearest neighbor. So given a new point anywhere in this plane, so let's say I, I drop a new point right here, I would classify this as a blue. If the point landed here, I would classify it as a red. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so here is what the decision boundary uh, looks. Um, again, using the same data. Um, and now I'm drawing you a different data set. And I'd like you to think real quick, what would the decision boundary look like? Now these data points are a little bit closer together. So just think about it yourself. Draw the decision boundaries in your mind. Does anybody want to use this new toy and show us the decision boundary? Yes. So you have to push this. Don't hurt anybody. <laughs> Good. Very nice. <laughs> All right. We got it. That's it? Okay. Any other opinions? That was good, but not complete. Something missing. Yes? Right, what about this guy here? 
that will be overfit. Okay, you're using terminology we haven't discussed yet. Can you say this in English? Yeah, so it could say it's a mistake, I'm going to ignore it. But if I don't want to ignore it, actually the machine learning algorithm doesn't ignore it, it's actually going to draw a little island around here. Right? Because technically, if anything lands within this cell, this is the closest neighbor. So if I follow the one nearest neighbor rule, anything in here needs to be classified as a red dot. So that's what I've shown here. Is that a good decision? Not really, right? It's not a good decision because as a human, I would say this is an outlier. So there's something, a misclassification. You know, whoever labeled this made a mistake. So the decision boundary should really be around here and this thing here shouldn't exist. But the one nearest neighbor classifier does what it does and that's exactly how it solves this issue. All right, so let's look at some properties for the one nearest neighbor classifier. Um, you have to agree it's simple. I could explain this to you with a couple slides and frankly the code for this kind of algorithm is very simple to code. So you basically store all of your data. When you're given a new data point, you look up which is the closest neighbor, okay? So it's simple to code and the performance is actually relatively good. It's surprisingly good considering how simple the algorithm is. We know that the decision boundary can be rough, to use a technical term, um, and it can have these islands, right? And so for the one nearest neighbor classifier, that's a little bit of a problem, especially if you have these islands where clearly that data point was an outlier. Okay, so let's see. Um, what do you think is the training complexity? In other words, what is the complexity you know, to train this algorithm given n data points. What do I have to do if I add a new training sample? Yeah. Yes, that's if you kept these Voronoi cells around. But let's assume we don't have the Voronoi cells. Let's just say we just have the data points. So during training, what do I do? Yes. No. It's too complicated because that would assume that for each data point I have to do n times work. But what do I have to do to just produce my training set? Yes. That's in the testing. There is no training, but in other words, it's complexity one, right? It's order one. So all I'm doing in training is I basically just keep everything around. That's it. I, you give me a new data set or a new data point with a label, I just add it. You give me another one, I just add it. So the complexity of adding stuff to the training set is order one. Right, so it's basically no work at all. Now, of course, the problem is what happens during testing, right? So now I'm giving you M data sets or M data points, and I'm asking you what labels do these have. So now you have to do what you said. For each of these M data points, I have to run through the N training samples and figure out which is the closest neighbor, right? So what's the complexity? Computer scientists? Yes? Yes, O of N times M, right? N training samples, M test samples. For each test sample, I have to run through all N. M times N. So this is a kind of a weird trade-off. I basically do no work during training, and I do all the work during testing. Is that good or bad? I mean, why is it weird? Why do I say it's weird? Well, what, yeah. Yeah. So when you use it, you do all the work. 
So this thing runs for a while, right? Let's say n is a million. Well, or let's say n is a billion. You know, let's say it's all of Google's images. So for each new image, I have to run through a billion images to figure out which one is the closest neighbor. That just takes a long time. So it's actually a bad trade-off, right? Normally, what machine learning likes to do is they like to spend a lot of time during training and then be very, very quick during testing so that you can return the result to the user as quickly as possible. Nobody cares about training time, but people really care about testing time. So that's one of the problems with this algorithm in general. Can anybody tell me roughly what is the error on the training set? Now, I haven't really described what the error is, so I'm just going to give you the answer here. The error is zero. <laughs> because in training, we're making no errors. Um, sorry, in, in basically, we're making no errors because we're always getting um, the answer of the nearest neighbor, right? So the training error is zero. And then finally, what about the variance bias trade-off that Joe talked about? This kind of algorithm, the one nearest neighbor algorithm in particular, what kind of variance and, and bias does it have? Well, the answer is actually kind of on this slide. We say it has a rough decision boundary. <coughs> so in other words, variance is how much does the algorithm change given new data, right? So given new training data, how much does that decision boundary change? And so if you think about it that way, for each new training set, I basically get another rough decision boundary. So the variance of this algorithm is quite high. The bias, however, is quite low because on average, all of them do quite well on the data set. So on average, the classification performance is good. So high variance, low bias. So what is an easy way to reduce the variance, or maybe I should say to reduce the roughness of the decision boundary of the one nearest neighbor classifier? Yes? Exactly. So now we're going to increase the number of neighbors that we're going to test, that we're going to consider. So now we do this majority voting, as opposed to just picking the closest. So here is the picture of the same data set I showed you before. Up on the left corner is the k equals 1 case. So again, we see this island here. Here is a, if I increase k to 3, and already we see that we got rid of the island problem because um, anything in this neighborhood will be classified by the other neighboring blue points, right? And if I increase k, you can see there's a little bit of weirdness here, so this is actually kind of more rough. But as I keep increasing k, this decision boundary gets smoother and smoother. What does that do to the variance and bias? Yeah. Exactly. It reduces the variance, increases the bias, right? So the variance is going to be lower for different test data sets. We get very similar performance. But I might introduce some bias. So the bias is going to be higher because now I have a very smooth boundary and I don't have maybe the exact boundary. And as I smooth this out more, my bias will actually increase. So here are the properties in general for k nearest neighbors. So we get rid of the islands. What happened to my, oh. If k is too large, this boundary, decision boundary might actually become too smooth. So I might actually make too many mistakes. Um, so it lowers the variance and increases the bias. And the question now is, how do we choose the ideal k? And I gave you the answer before. Does anybody remember? Cross-validation, Cross right. So what does that mean? I know you guys haven't really studied this, but does anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, so you split your data into a training set and a test set. You use the training set to build your model, and then you use it on the test set to evaluate the performance. Good. Now, when we say build the model, what does actually, you know, what kind of decisions do we have to make to build the model? Well, one decision is this parameter k. And this parameter is called a hyperparameter, right? So that's one decision. What is another decision we need to make? Yeah. Right. For the actual validation, we need to decide how many data points go to the training and to the test set. 
But in terms of the algorithm, there is a couple more decisions we need to make. I kind of glanced over that, but yeah. Yes, how do we measure distance, right? When I show it in 2D, you intuitively assume it's Euclidean distance, it's the, it's the shortest path between two points. But that doesn't have to be the case. I can actually pick different distance metrics and I'll show you a couple a little later on. So the distance function is another one and there is one last one which came up I think before when we talked about the majority voting. How do you actually decide this majority voting and I just said we'll do it probabilistically but there's probably other ways of doing it that might maybe improve performance a little bit. So there's a couple of decisions we have to make and all of those decisions can be formulated as hyperparameters. So these are the hyperparameters that we need to optimize during cross-validation. All right, so we're training on the de training data, test on the test data, uh, and then we pick the K that has the lowest test error. Um, now, there's a problem with this, and that problem is usually we don't have a lot of training data, right? So, you know, you actually have to label all the training data, so that's a lot of work. So if you had 10,000 images labeled, um, you know, it's actually quite a lot already, and you might not want to give up much of that for your test data. And more importantly, in your training, you may not want to use the whole training set because then you only get to optimize it once. And the problem with that is that, statistically speaking, you're just using one sample set and, you know, your K may not actually be optimal and may not generalize to future test data. So what you want to do is you want to actually split that training data into smaller sets. And so this is the picture of cross-validation. So what you're doing is you're taking your training data and you split it into folds. And in this case, this is five-fold cross-validation. So you split it into folds and you use one of those folds to optimize your hyperparameters. And that's called the validation data, right? So that yellow fold, fold number five, is the validation data. So you do this by changing the validation data five times. So you pick any one of those five folds as validation to pick your parameter, and you use the other ones for training in those cases. And then when you're done, you take the average of those parameters, or you, know, you have some other procedure of picking it, so you pick your optimal parameter, and then you go to test on the test data. Okay, so the test data is only used once at the very end. So again, you're starting with these folds. You iterate over your choice of folds. So right now I pick fold five, so that's my validation fold. So that fold is actually gonna use, be used if you were as quote unquote test data for my hyperparameters, right? So I'm just gonna validate my hyperparameter. So I'm gonna train on folds one through four. I'm gonna test my hyperparameter on fold five and I'm gonna see what kind of performance I get. Then I'm gonna pick fold four as my validation set, and then I'm gonna use folds one, two, three, and five as training sets for that, and then optimize my hyperparameter for that and test it on fold four, and so on. So I do this five times, and then I basically, after I do that, average the parameters with the best performance on the validation data. And once I'm done, I basically call that, that's my final hyperparameters. Yeah? Is it a good idea to iterate over the possible numbers of folders? Like here you choose five folders. Yeah. Like four or six. Like how do you choose that? How do you choose the number of folds? Yeah. Um, I was going to say intuition. I don't know if that's the best answer. <laughs> you guys have better answers. <laughs> intuition, I think. Typically, people know for which kind of classifiers how much of cross-validation you do. So five-fold and ten-fold are typical numbers. Um, to be yeah, honest... On the size of the data set that you have. Yes, that's like a good answer. You, like you can imagine if you have five-fold, right? If you have only very little training data and you're using five-fold, then you have more points, data points in each fold than if you would do ten-fold, right? So your validation yeah, so if you have very small data, you don't want to do tenfold cross-validation, you want to do five or even threefold, you know. Um, 
Yes. Yes. That's always a concern. Um, however, you know, the idea is that you kind of picked your test data randomly, right? You picked 30% of your original data set as test data, and hopefully you made that in an unbiased way, that choice. But that's always a concern, absolutely right. And there is no guarantee that your classifier will perform well on new data. It's just you, all you can do is measure it on some test data. So the test data is not used to determine the parameters, the hyperparameters. That's very, very important, right? Do not touch the test data because the test data is so valuable. You want to use all of your training data and the five folds in this case to estimate your hyperparameters and then test them at the very end on the test data. So again, evaluate the test set only a single time at the very end. Right, and that's, that's really important. And frankly, even researchers get that wrong sometimes. Um, and it's annoying if you read a paper where it's obvious that they didn't do that. Why is that a problem, by the way? Why should you not use your test data to estimate your parameters? Might as well. It's, you know, data is tough to get by. Yeah. They're not generalizable. So the results are not generalizable, right? Because you've basically contaminated your parameters with all of the data, if, as it were. So you can't really know how your classifier will perform on completely new unseen data. So the test data has to be completely new and unseen. OK, so let me just give you an example. So here is a data set with images. This is called the CIFAR 10 data set. Uh, in this case, it has 60,000 images. Each one is tiny. It's only 32 by 32 pixels, so you kind of see blowed up versions of this. And it has 10 classes that you see there on the left. And this is just giving you the, you know, basically a uh, training set, right? So you can see the different classes and what kind of images are in it. And again, you see the wide variety of pictures for each of the classes. So the training set, I mean, these, uh, this database was split up into a training set of 50,000 images and then a test set of 10,000 images. And by the way, this is from a wonderful course at Stanford um, that I linked to at the end of the lecture. So you can follow this example even with Python code um, on their website that I give you at the end. So how do you turn pictures into data points in a high dimension? Well, you basically turn them into vectors. So a picture has red, green, and blue pixels, right? You can think of it as a red, green, and blue plane. In this case, each red, green, and blue channel has 32 by 32 pixels. So you basically roll that out. You unroll it into a very long vector with over 3,000 dimensions. So this is a very high dimensional problem. So you have 3,000 dimensions, right? Each one of these vector entries is a different dimension in this high dimensional space. Now is the actual space of those 10 classes 3,000 dimensional? What do you think? Probably not, right? So it's probably much lower intrinsic dimensionality. But nevertheless, we have this very long vector. And here is how we can define a distance between two pictures. We basically just take the absolute difference between their pixel values. And we can do this basically by just taking the absolute differences between two picture vectors, right? So you have two 3,000 dimensional vectors. You take the difference, you take the absolute value of the difference, and that's going to spit out that number here at the end. That's going to be your distance. This particular distance is called the L1 distance or the Manhattan distance. So it's just the absolute value between two vectors. And so it's a relative simple measure. And you, know, you can argue, is it good or bad, or is it better or worse um, than others? So here is, for completeness, a couple other distance metrics. We already talked about the Euclidean distance. That's what you would understand in the image plane as basically the shortest path between two, two points. And that generalizes into higher dimensions. So here you would take the difference squared between those two image vectors and then the square root of that. 
And then more generally, you have the LP norm, which is shown here on the bottom as the formula. So there's different kinds of P norms. But L1 and L2 are the most common ones and the ones that probably you will encounter most often. There's other types of distances um, that I'm not sure we'll talk about later, but um, you know, these are the most common ones. Okay, so here is a picture of this k-nearest neighbor classifier. Again, you have these picture data points now in this 3,000 dimensional space. Here's just a 2D picture of that. The nearest neighbor classifier doesn't do so well. The five nearest neighbor classifier would draw probably better decision boundaries. So how do you pick the k? Well, you basically have to do cross-validation. So in this case, they did five-fold cross-validation on this data set. And on the bottom here, you see the parameter k. It goes from 0 to 100. And then over here, you see the accuracy. And the accuracy is just, in this case, measured as number of right predictions uh, made by the classifier divided by number of the right predictions in the ground truth. Right? So you compare the labels in your classifier with the labels in the ground truth, and you figure out how many times did it get the right label. And as you can see, uh, because it's five-fold cross-validation, for each value of k, you get five different results from those five validation folds, right? Remember, you pick five validation folds. And so here is basically that picture. So you take the mean, and then you can see the spread here. So probably somewhere around here, actually around k equals 7, is the best choice of your parameter k. And then if you do that, uh, you basically get performance that's for an L1 distance about 40%, and for an L2 distance, it's only about 35% accuracy. And here is just a bunch of examples. So, you know, these were the test images now, and here are the 10 nearest neighbor in this, you know, 5NN classifier. So I can't even see what that is. Anyway, this is a ship, and you see a bunch of ships here. Um, that's actually pretty good, although that is a train, I believe. Here is a, an airplane, and here is some kind of a dog, and a ship, and a frog. So that's not so good. Um, here is another ship. Ship seems to be working pretty well. Um, here is a horse. That looks like a deer. That looks like a dog, etc. So you can see, you know, it doesn't do great, right? And basically what it does, it looks mostly at the background, right? Yeah, Verena pointed that out. So it, it kind of does that. And why is that, you think? Yeah. Yes, most of the pixels are background pixels, exactly. And this very, very simple distance metric where we just take the differences in a pixel by pixel is not a very good classification. So what can we do to improve that? There's one keyword I mentioned earlier today. We have to pick different. Different features, thank you. Features, so right now the features are the pixels, right? It's actually, you know, it's, it's the simplest thing you can possibly do. You take pixel by pixel difference. Well, that doesn't account for any variation in viewpoint or any variation in shift and rotation, or any variation in lighting, etc. It doesn't account for any of the problems we talked about in the beginning. So this is really, really simple. Now, I can tell you that the best classifiers on this data set achieve about 95% accuracy. So just to give you an idea. And those best classifiers are based on neural network um, architectures that we'll talk about at the very end of this class in, in one lecture at the end, right? Um, but, you know, and, and by the way, human performance on this data set is about 94%. So the algorithm does basically as well as humans do. Okay, so one of the problems is that this pixel distance is really bad. So just to show you, all of these pictures here have the same L2 pixel distance to the original, right? So if this is my original picture, this is a shifted one. It has a certain L2 distance. Well, the same L2 distance is between those two, 
and the same one is between those two. And of course, for us, it's obvious that they're very, very different, but the L2 distance with a pixel feature is just very, very bad. So instead, what people have done, and that's part of a huge piece of literature of work in, in computer vision, is come up with better features than pixel by pixel difference. And you know, here's just one example. This is the so-called SIFT features. They're rotation invariant, they're scale invariant, and you, know, you basically can find the features on this left truck, and you find the same features on the right truck, and you can match them up. And those features are much more robust to do this kind of image recognition. And so people use much more sophisticated features than pixel by pixel difference. So the choice of feature is one of the most important things that you can do in any kind of classification. Um, to give you another example, so if you, you know, build a self-driving car, what kind of features should you pick? Well, you should pick anything you can get your hands at, right? Because it's a very difficult problem. And to solve that very difficult problem, researchers have put all kinds of instrumentation on these cars. So you have, you know, LIDAR, which is basically range images. You have video, of course. You have ultrasound. You have radar um, all, all around the car. And all of these different sensors give you different features of your environment, which will, which will uh, then make the, the task of classification and object detection and road detection much easier. So again, here is a picture of those features. So this is what a laser scan looks like of the environment. It's literally a 3D representation of the environment around the car. They have pictures of the environment. They have elevation models from maps, like Google Maps. They have models of the roads. They have stationary maps from the sky, from you know, satellites. And of course, they have the built-in cameras. So all of these things help cars drive by themselves. So then the question becomes, well, if that's the game, why don't we just, for every problem we have, add more and more features, right? Wouldn't that make our lives a lot easier? It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> it doesn't. Why doesn't adding more features make our lives easier if we are training classifiers? Yes? It takes more time. It takes more time. Yes, that's true. Um, but let's assume I can compute these features very quickly. That's not the real deep answer, uh, the, the, the deep reason. It's one reason, true. Yes? And the data gets too sparse. The data gets too sparse. And why does it get too sparse? Yeah, I'm looking for a key phrase that Joe mentioned. Yes? Curse of dimensionality. Thank you. So the curse of dimensionality, right? As we're adding more and more features, we're making our data more and more high dimensional. Remember the feature vector of the pixels was 3,000 dimensions, was 3,000 long? Well, if I add more features, I can make this 10,000 or 100,000 or a million. You know, all of these features that we saw in the self-driving car, they make these vectors extremely long. So if I took all of that data, eventually I really have this problem that basically my space is so sparse. I basically have no more nearest neighbors, or if they are nearest neighbors, they'd be too far away to be meaningful. And so that's the problem. That's the curse of dimensionality. So we can't have too, high, you know, too many high dimensions. Um, to do this classification. So we're kind of in a pickle, right? On one hand, we're saying classification would be easier if we used more features. And on the other hand, we're running against the curse of dimensionality. OK, so what can we do? Yes? Yes, so we can basically bring it down into a lower dimensional problem, exactly. And that's what I want to talk about next. And that you know, is basically what dimensionality reduction is trying to do, right? So we have a high dimensional problem, you know, these pixel vectors with 3,000 entries or 3,000 dimensions. So we want to bring that down. We don't actually believe that in that data set that problem was 3,000 dimensional. 
right? We actually think the intrinsic dimension of that problem is a lot lower. So we want to bring down the dimensionality of those vectors while still preserving, what are we trying to preserve? Let's say we're doing nearest neighbor classification. Yes? Yeah, we, not necess we don't necessarily preserve the variance. We might actually make the variance lower because we're kind of smoothing out the data as it were. Yeah? We're not going to change the difference between the categories because that's intrinsic to the problem, right? We're n the stuff that we want to keep. Yeah, we're changing some difference, but it's not the difference between the categories. Actually, we're trying to keep some difference. And what is the, I think you're saying the right thing, but maybe, the thank you, <laughs> the distance. We're trying to preserve the distance, right? The distance in the lower dimensional space between neighboring points should be reflective of their distance in the higher dimensional space, right? So that's part of the game. Okay, so there is lots of high dimensional data, in particular if we add features, you know, just think about text, images we already talked about, even time varying data or gene expression. There's lots of problems where we have very high dimensional data where we want to reduce the dimensions. And so the basic idea is to project this high dimensional space into a lower dimensional subspace that kind of best fits the data and that tries to preserve the distances between these data points in the higher dimensions. And in this case, the projection of these data points is shown as a hyperplane. So this is a linear projection and it's a linear subspace. So a lot of the dimensionality reduction techniques are linear because if that works, it's a lot easier to compute. So the questions you need to ask yourself in these linear models, is the linear model actually going to be accurate enough? Does the data really lie in this linear subspace? And so for these examples here, the answer is yes. On the left, I have some, some two-dimensional data, but intrinsically, it's really only one-dimensional. And then on the right, I have some three-dimensional data, but intrinsically, it's only really two-dimensional, right? So I can say yes, it is still a good fit to this data. And then if that's the case, you know, what is that dimensionality of the data, and how do we figure that out? So before I tell you how PCA does this, I'm going to show you a cool example of why PCA is useful. Um, we already talked about dimensionality reduction. PCA, by the way, is also very useful for compression. And it's very useful for visualization. So this is the cool example I want to show you. I'll show you a quick clip from uh, a master's thesis project uh, at MIT by Anita Lilly. Um, that uses music data. Music Flash is a music browser that creates maps of music libraries. In the center of the screen, you see a library of about 500 songs. Each song is represented by a colored circle. The location of each of these songs is determined by a principal components analysis of the song's acoustic features. This analysis results in songs being placed close to each other if they sound similar, and farther apart if they sound more different. Right now, the song circles are colored according to genre. This genre comes directly from the song's metadata. It's not being inferred from the song's acoustic properties. Color coding the genre in this way lets us see how acoustically distinct different genres are. In this library, classical music lays almost completely along the right-hand side. It is acoustically distinct from the other genres in the library. You can also see that rap music lies at the opposite side of the map. It sounds very different from classical music. In the center area, you see a mishmash of genres. This is where rock music sits, overlapping with dance, pop, country, and the leftmost edge of the classical group. This makes sense when you think about how diverse the rock genre can be. So, I'm not going to play the whole video, but I want to quickly reiterate what she said and, and explain what you're seeing. So first of all, over here, you see this is a long list of features that she used to classify these songs, okay? 
Um, you can see there's a slider here. If you, you know, slide this down, there's probably like 3,000 different features that you can extract from music data that are useful for classification. So she starts out with very high dimensional uh, data set. For each song, she computes these 3,000 or so features. And some of these features have high dimensionality in themselves. Then she classifies the training set into the different genres. So these are the labels, right? So you have classical, rock, et cetera, et cetera. And then she did a principal components analysis, or PCA, of the data to project it into this two-dimensional subspace, right? So this is a two-dimensional subspace in this very high-dimensional feature space. And it turns out, within that projection, songs that have similar labels are close to each other. So it did preserve, it appears, the distances between those songs in the high-dimensional space. And then she goes on, um, the whole video is actually about what can you do with this kind of interface, and it has to do with creating different playlists and, you know, finding your most favorite type of music, etc. So it's actually a very cool interface um, that is using the PCA. But does the basic idea make sense? Yeah. Yes. That's a great question. So what does the X and Y axis here mean? Well, right now, the X and Y axis are the first and the second principal component. And quite frankly, they don't mean much, except that that's what they are. And so, you know, you can't really, in your head, think about a 3,000-dimensional space and this kind of hyperplane through it. But, you know, that's kind of what's going on. So you have this very high-dimensional space. You're taking all those points and you're projecting them onto a plane that best fits your data. And that's the two principal components here. So let me show you a couple pictures, maybe that will make this question a little bit clearer. By the way, it's called principal with an A and not principal with an E, just, uh, just principal component analysis, PCA. Um, so, you know, what's the dimensionality of this data? And, um, well, the dimensionality of the data is 2D because it's 2D points. But what is the intrinsic dimensionality? Is it A, 1D, B, 2D, or C, 1 1⁄2D? What do you guys think? Who's picking A? Who's picking B? Who's picking C? All right, the A's have it. So, yes, this is intrinsically one-dimensional data, so I should be able to approximate it with basically this line here, right? And this will be my first principal component. So what principal components are, they're basically a transformation of my original coordinate space into this principal component space. And typically what you do is you subtract the mean from your data, so everything is centered at the origin, so it turns into a rotation of your original coordinate space. All right, so... Um, what we want to do is we want to choose our principal components such that we minimize the orthogonal distances of each of the data points to this new vector v. And equivalently, we can actually could prove this mathematically. We're not going to do this. But it has been shown that that's the same thing as putting v in the direction of maximum variance in the data, right? So in other words, the maximum spread of your data points is the direction of V. If you pick it that way, you're also minimizing the orthogonal projection of the data points onto that vector. So that's how we're going to find the principal components. I want to quickly point out the similarities and differences with linear regression. And Joe already did this in his lecture. I just want to bring it back here. So linear regression, we have the case where we have data points. We're trying to find an approximation to these data points that is the best fit. But in this case, we're basically looking at the difference of the data points along the original axis of the data, right? So in this case, along the y-axis. In the principal components case, we're looking for the best fit based on the ortho orthogonal projection of the data. So it's not along the original axis, it's this orthogonal projection of the data points and you get two different lines. 
of the same data. All right, so we want to minimize the projection distance, which is equivalent to basically maximizing the spread of the data along that direction. And I'll give you the sketch of the algorithm without mathematically writing it down, but we're going to basically, again, subtract the mean from the data, so we center all the data set around the zero point, around the origin. We might have to scale each of the dimensions of the data by its variance, so if you have, you know, kilometers versus, um, you know, nanometers, then that is not a good thing because those two you know, axes are very, very different in scale. So you may have to rescale things. Um, that actually depends on the application and the problem. Um, and then you compute the covariance matrix of your data, which is basically your original data matrix X transposed times X, right? So that's fundamentally what your covariance matrix is. Yes? Yes, so again, it depends on the application. You might just get away by ignoring that, and that's fine. You just treat them as data points. Um, so the question was, what if you have color and weight, right? Well, you stack everything, you know, color is a feature, weight is a feature. In the end, it's just a long vector of features. So you kind of abstracted that away. And maybe you can get away with it by not rescaling it, and maybe that's fine. If the differences between those are too big, then you have to rescale it. And there's different versions of rescaling. Uh, one that's very often used is basically um, divided by the variance to kind of bring it back into the same range. Yeah. Yes, that's a great question. So can you weigh uh, features differently um, depending, you know, on your basically application knowledge, right? We know that color is the most important one. Um, and the answer is yes. You can either do that by, you know, um, just having fewer samples of the other features. That would be one thing. Or you could just have um, basically a different algorithm that actually allows you to weigh the, the features. And uh, I think Verena will talk about these algorithms in future lectures. So once you have the covariance matrix of your data, the covariance matrix captures for each of the different dimensions how much is the spread along that dimension and all of their cross products, right? And so basically we can then compute uh, the k-largest eigenvectors of that covariance matrix and those eigenvectors are the principal components of your PCA. I'm not going to explain how you compute these eigenvectors. Um, that's actually hopefully going to be covered in one of your linear algebra classes. If you don't know, I recommend that you look it up on Wikipedia. Um, however, having said that, the way that most people compute the PCA is through an algorithm called SVD, or Singular Value Decomposition, which is actually much more robust than what I'm showing you here. So the implementation details of how PCAs are computed might differ, but the fundamental idea is the same. So the question then is, once you've done that, how do you pick the dimensions that are intrinsic? Or in other words, you know, what is the intrinsic dimensionality of your data set? And the cool thing, the really cool thing about the PCA is it actually gives you that answer. So what you can do is you can plot your eigenvalues of each eigenvector that's shown here on the x-axis, and you can show the variance that it explains on the y-axis. And there's a simple formula for, you know, the variance that each eigenvector explains. Um, and so, basically, I forget, is it the eigenvalue squared, something like that, or square root? Anyway, there's a formula that explains it. And so you plot this, and this is called a scree plot, and then you find where this curve starts to diminish. In other words, where you're not explaining any more variance with your eigenvectors. And in this case, you know, that number might be around seven or so. So that means intrinsically your dimensionality is only seven dimensions, even though the data set may have 60 or so dimensions. Does that make sense? 
Okay. So, let me give you a couple examples of dimensionality reduction. Um, well, here's just another picture. So, once you have your principal components, you can project your data points onto that principal component. And for visualization purposes, you just pick your first two principal component vectors, and you'd make a projection of your data onto those, and you produce a 2D picture. So that's what's happening here. So from this 3D data set, we can produce this 2D picture. And this works for uh, any high dimensional data set. So let me show you a couple examples now. So um, a classic classification example is handwriting, in particular handwritten digits. Um, who do you think has the most interest in classifying handwritten digits? Banking, financial industry, right? That's because our ATMs can now read our checks. In the 80s, um, there was another institution that was very interested in handwritten digits before we had ATMs that could read checks. And that institution is still very interested in that. Say it again. The tax office? No, they're not that. F they're still in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Police? No, not so much. Post office, right? You don't think that somebody's actually going to read your address and then stuff it into the right mail back at the post office? No, this is all happening automatically. So handwriting recognition was a huge problem in the 1980s, and the post office spent a lot of money on it. There were a lot of data sets that were being made public that people started to train classifiers for. And basically handwritten uh, handwriting recognition is by and large a solved problem today. And it's thanks to, you know, all of these great research papers. So here is one of those data sets. Um, in this case, all you're seeing is a bunch of examples of handwritten uh, um, digits, uh, three. So this is 130. And, you know, the question is, can you compute a principal component analysis of this? And the answer, of course, is yes. So you compute features of this data set, and in this case, you might actually just take the raw pixel images, which is what this people, these people did for illustration purposes. And on the bottom here, you see the first three principal components of this particular data set. So the first one is the mean. I should point. So this here is the mean of all of these images. This here is the first principal component, and this is the second principal component. And what this is saying is that any of these pictures here, it died, <laughs> can be explained by a linear combination of the mean plus lambda 1 times the first principal component plus lambda 2 times the second principal component. Right? And so that's a, a nice compression, and it's a nice dimensionality reduction of that data set. And then, of course, you need to figure out what is the reconstruction error, right? So the reconstruction error is, well, given this approximation, how well does it fit the data? And Verena will actually talk about error metrics and how we compare, you know, different errors. So um, here is another picture of the PCA space for this data set. So on the left is a projection of the original data onto this space, and on the right, for each of these red points, you see the corresponding um, reconstruction. And so you can see that the PCA space automatically kind of figured out there is threes that are thinner and threes that are thicker. That's sort of kind of the diagonal direction. And then threes that have a bigger round on the, on the bottom versus threes that are more slanted on the bottom. That's kind of the other diagonal. So you kind of see that these, you know, principal components span kind of the variation in this very small data set pretty nicely. And here is all nine digits. Uh, again, on the left is the mean, and then you see the first principal component and so on. And, you know, you can see as you go towards the right that the reconstruction gets bigger. I'm sorry, this is actually reconstructions using two principal components three or four or five, et cetera, until using 100. And so you see that depending on how many components you use, you get a better and better reconstruction. 
The cool thing is that you can do the exact same thing for faces. So again, in the 1990s, uh, face recognition was basically an unsolved problem. And so people started to look at it. And one of the ideas was, well, let's reduce the dimensionality of, of pictures of faces. So they took lots of pictures of faces and again had small versions of them and then basically computed the PCA for face images. So you take these pictures, you line them up as long vectors of pixels, 4,000 dimensional vectors, and then you compute the PCA of that. And you know, instead of calling them eigenvectors, they called them eigenfaces. Right? So one of the most famous face recognition papers is actually the eigenfaces paper. So here you see the mean on the left. That's the average face from this training set, plus the first principal component, the second, the third, and so on and so on. Now what strikes me about this is that they all kind of look similar, right? So you can already tell that maybe only the first four or five components of these eigenfaces are really explaining most of the variance in this data set. After a certain number, you're basically just improving the reconstruction a little bit, but they kind of start to look very, very similar. So you probably don't need those anymore. So you can really reduce your dimensionality. And then to reconstruct, again, you do the same thing. You take your eigenvectors times your basis face images, and here you see the original on the left, and on the right is a reconstruction with 50 eigenfaces. And it looks actually very good at least for these low resolution images. All right, we're basically out of time. I just want to touch on one last topic, and that's going to be quick. Uh, there is a, a related algorithm to PCA, which is called MDS, multidimensional scaling. And essentially, it's doing the same thing. And you might come across it, because it's very useful for projections of higher dimensional data. The difference is that instead of giving it the raw data, remember we took the data vector or the data matrix, and we computed its covariance matrix. Instead of doing that, you give it a matrix with distance vectors between your data points. So you decide your distance metric, and then you compute all of the pairwise distances of your high dimensional data, and you put those into a distance matrix. So for each entry in the matrix, you have a distance between those two data points. And if you do that, then you can basically compute PCA on that distance matrix. There is some linear algebra mumbo jumbo that happens in between, but you can show that you can basically compute a PCA on this and then do a projection, and that projection will preserve the distances in the projection as best as possible. Right? So it's not, pro it's not preserving the orthog it's not minimizing the orthogonal projection error onto the components. It's basically trying to preserve the distances in the high dimensional data in the projection. So one classic example to demonstrate this is you can give it the latitude, longitude coordinates of cities, and you compute the distances, the pairwise distances between cities, shown here. And then you can project those in this MDS projection shown on the left and compare that to the actual map of Europe. And it's a pretty good match. So this projection preserves the original distances that you gave it. You can do the same thing for images. So here is an MDS projection of color images, just pixel-wise differences. And you can see it does a pretty good job of grouping similarly looking pictures in the same region of space. And here is one for Facebook, France. OK, so that's all I have for today. Um, I have some more stuff on nonlinear methods, but we're out of time. And Frankly, in this class, we're not going to touch nonlinear methods. But if you want to look at the slides, um, there's a little more information about those. Any questions? All right, great. Thank you. See you next week.